Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Through the Magic Door, A History of Brooklyn Immigration. My name is Randy Amalfitano, and I work in our Tandon Office of Student Affairs. Our office was charged with planning some innovative programming this semester around the NYU Reed selection, Exit West. We are thrilled to welcome the Center for Brooklyn History for our final NYU Reads event for this semester. Before I bring our guests out, a few housekeeping notes for you all. This session will be recorded. Um, all registrants will receive the link in approximately two weeks. So look out in your email if you can't stay for the entire time. Live closed captioning is available by clicking on the bottom of your screen, the closed caption button. And we will have some time at the end for Q&A. So feel free to use the chat function to put some questions in throughout the presentation and you will be able to come off mute at the end to ask Michelle some of your questions as well. Without further ado, I'm excited to welcome Michelle Montalbano. Michelle Montalbano is a reference librarian at Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History, where she works on instruction, outreach, reference, programming, and exhibitions, among other things. She received her MLIS from Simmons College in 2016. She has worked in publishing, digital archives, classrooms, bars, and restaurants, and she loves a good list. So do I, Michelle. She is a non-straight cis white woman whose family came to Brooklyn in the early 20th century from Italy and France. Her pronouns are she and her. Michelle, welcome and thank you so much. We're looking forward to this. Thank you so much, Randy, for the introduction and thank you uh, all for being here and for having me. I am so excited to be able to share this history of migration and immigration in Brooklyn with all of you um, and to set it in the context of larger Brooklyn history um, and uh, pair it with the themes of Exit West. Um, I Some of these materials uh, have never before been used in a public program like this. So it's, again, such a rare opportunity to get to interface with our materials, especially while we're still closed. Uh, before anything else, though, I wanted to give a little bit of a sort of overview of how this presentation is going to work in my historiographic method. So this talk pairs archival materials, photographs, maps, and ephemera mostly from the Center for Brooklyn History's collections with oral histories, placing the lived experiences of the people whose stories I'm privileged enough to be telling at the center of the narrative. Um, so I am not positioning myself as an authority um, and as much as possible, I am telling the story of individual lives and not entire groups of people. Uh, I also want to begin with a land acknowledgement um, and this is care of Brooklyn Public Library's uh, land acknowledgement working group. The Brooklyn Public Library stands on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people as a sign of respect to the Lenape Delaware nations past, present and future. The Brooklyn Public Library is committed to actively addressing our past and the pervasive legacy of colonialism, exclusion, and erasure by amplifying Indigenous voices, narratives, and works. I also want to point out that the archives are often considered a tool for dismantling white supremacy. How? Not all silences are equal. Whose stories are told and whose are sidelined or, or erased are, is worth questioning. Uh, the documentary filmmaker Raoul Peck puts it this way, our job as filmmakers, writers, historians, image makers, and I'll add archivists to this list, is to deconstruct these silences. Again, going forward, you will encounter some mention of racist policies around immigration and racist policies around migration and black lives. We must acknowledge America's history of settler colonialism, enslavement, ongoing structural racism and oppression, xenophobia, while we also celebrate the plurality and diversity of this borough. Um, you will also encounter outdated and oppressive language. Uh, CBH is involved in an ongoing project to remediate the use of this language in our own finding aids and records. What is the Center for Brooklyn History? Uh, we began as BPL's local history archive called the Brooklyn Collection in 1997, but we merged with Brooklyn Historical Society in October of 2020 to become the uh, uh, sort of mega institution that has uh, the world's largest collection of 
uh, materials related to Brooklyn's history in the world. Uh, we organize and preserve CBH holdings. We have exhibitions, programming, educational initiatives, and public programs like these. Um, and we conduct all kinds of virtual workshops. Uh, we are located in the Pierpont Street building in Brooklyn Heights, which was home to the Brooklyn Historical Society for 140 years. <clears throat> All right, and this is where we sort of begin our journey. The themes of Exit West. Uh, Masin Hamid, the author, explores a lot of the reasons for migration, many of which are forced, right? And you will hear many of the speakers in our oral histories describe the reasons that they left their countries and homes and came to America. Some of the examples you'll hear address war, famine, oppression, repressive societies, but you'll also hear people refer to economic opportunity or looking for more of a sense of home and belonging. And I also wanted to highlight the magical realist uh, approach that Masin Hamid took to writing this book. Uh, you've dug into this a great deal more, but I did in fact read this book as part of BPL's Literary Prize Committee in 2017. Um, but he, the characters traveled to Mykonos and to California using this series of magic doors, right? Uh, and then what does magical realism actually do to, uh, to deepen the themes that Mohsin Hamid uh, is exploring? These are questions that I want to maybe save room for at the end of this. Because this slide is going to cram over 200 years of Brooklyn history into a bite sized morsel. Uh, so, this information functions as a bit of a historical backdrop. It also demonstrates that the population boom that made Brooklyn into the city and eventually a borough that it is today is due to immigration and industry, and these go hand in hand. But the beginning, really, the Dutch after as the settler colonialism began, the Dutch built six towns, uh, Bushwick, Flatbush, Brooklyn, New Utrecht, and Flatlands between 1648 and 1666. Gravesend was built in 1643. Um, the Erie Canal and the first wave also set the tone for the population booms that were to come. The Erie Canal was completed in 1825 and solidified New York's place. Uh, as a seat of transcontinental commerce because it connected the Atlantic Ocean uh, to the Great Lakes and the rest of the country, uh, which meant that people were pouring in, merchants, mechanics, manufacturers for this expanded job market. Um, the first major wave of European immigration was 1840 to 1845. Uh, they came from all over and they included people leaving for the reasons that we just discussed, including escaping famine, um, and disruption of a failed revolution. Um, and people, as I mentioned, were coming from places like Norway, Ireland, Finland, Italy, Greece, and Poland. The population during these years doubled to nearly 80,000. Um, 10 years later, nearly half of Brooklyn's 205,000 residents had been born overseas. Another major event, uh, was the building and the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. This is the Brooklyn Daily Eagle page on the day that this was announced to the public. A more diverse crowd arrived in the late 1880s. The second wave of immigration brought Russian Jews, Italians, Poles, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, and Finns. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge opened, which allowed easy access between Manhattan and Brooklyn for the first time. And then another major event that happened after this in 1898 was the consolidation of Brooklyn with Greater New York when it became a borough and not an independent city. Between World War I and the 1930s, tens of thousands of Black Southerners made their way into Brooklyn's neighborhoods. They were among the hundreds of thousands who moved to northern cities during the Great Migration, and by 1930, more than 60% of Black Brooklynites had been born outside of the borough. What was the impetus for this exodus from the South? 
the opportunity to pursue jobs outside of domestic and personal service was finally opening jobs that involved both skilled and unskilled labor in a wider range of industries. These jobs had been previously filled by immigrants, but immigration had closed uh, due to the Great War, World War I, or it had actually slowed to a real, a real trickle. This article states that 50,000 Black Southerners have migrated to Brooklyn and 500,000 to Northern cities altogether since World War I and urges facing the resulting housing shortage squarely and with common sense. Uh, the problem referred to here appears to be about ensuring that Black citizens of this country enjoy all the rights and privileges of white citizens, uh, citing with horror high death rates, housing shortages, and standards of living, uh, creating space not as a favor, but as a right. And these are all quotes from the article. I also wanted to take a moment to point out a few notable pieces of legislation around immigration. The Center for Brooklyn History holds the Emanuel Seller Collection, uh, whose name is the latter half of the 1965 Hart Seller Act, which reversed the 1920s Immigration Act that set discriminatory quotas uh, for people coming to our country from non-European countries. Uh, the 1965 Hart Seller Act was considered by many historians to be an extension of the fight for civil rights um, and the first major uh, exclusionary act of immigration legislation was in 1882. And here is a close up shot of the bill itself to amend the Immigration and National act, Nationality Act, uh, which was again brought to the floor by Mr. Seller. The oral history collections are, again, the main way that we are going to explore the rest of this talk. Uh, these were begun in 1973. Uh, the legacy oral history collections from Brooklyn Historical Society now include over 1,200 interviews. These are intimate conversations with people about their lives. Um, and they have been recorded and shared. So this is a real privilege to be able to gain insight into people's lives uh, throughout the 20th century. And again, going forward, we're going to center this presentation on neighborhoods and then click into an oral history. So the first we'll begin with is Muslims in Brooklyn, bed in downtown along Atlantic Avenue. Uh, this photo here is from 19, sorry, the screen is obscured a little bit, 1975 and was taken by Khalil Abdul, Abdul Kabir. Uh, and it depicts the Darul Islam, also known as the Dar, one of the most significant grassroots movements established by African-American Sunni Muslims in the United States. Um, the founding members of the Dar came from the Islamic Mission of America, which was founded in 1939 um, on State Street. And between 1962 and 1963, members of the State Street Mosque broke away and founded a new mosque, first in Brownsville, and then later on Herkimer Place in bed -Stuy. At the height of the movement, there were over 40 mosques connected to the Dar movement in the United States. And so this is the oral history here. We're going to begin around the three minute mark. So, uh... Even though he was making money way better than, better than my grandfather, my grandfather was really poor. Okay, and uh, he still was ambitious and he wanted to immigrate for a better life. Okay, and he was able to immigrate. He, at that time, for you to do, to do an immigration, I think uh, you had to be not married. You had to be not married. So my father in 1960 had to divorce my mom, okay? And she had, she had uh, three boys, okay? And she, he had to divorce her in order for him to get a visa. I don't know what kind of visa he got, whether, whether it was, a, whether it was a, a, a visitor's visa or immigration visa, and he went to Venezuela, South America. And he went to Venezuela, Colombia, Venezuela, and then over there, he was introduced to a, a lady that her father was half Palestinian, 
they got married, and then they did papers, and she brought him to America. But she never liked America. She went back. She went right back. You know, I guess she knew that that's what that's what she was doing. Just bring it to this family, and she, they paid it for a dowry. Now it belongs to belong to her family. So they would they would cultivate the olives when it's when it's cultivated when they when it's the season for that. And uh, he came to America, and he became he was a vendor. He was he was he couldn't he didn't have education, he didn't have enough education to get uh, any other job, desk job, or whatever. okay. So he was, he, was, he was a street vendor. He had friends, he came to a friend. His friend, uh, Joe Taya at that time was selling, used to have a little store on, a, on uh, Atlantic Avenue, he used to sell watches. Uh, so he used to give him watches and go sell in the street and he made money. My dad was very smart, he made money. Okay, and he was very ambitious. He was very ambitious. And like I said, when he was back home, he became almost like an architect. That's how he, he sort of like, he gained that expertise from the field, you know? And I'll stop there for now, but I do encourage anyone to, again, revisit these oral histories themselves later or bring up something that you're interested in asking more about as we go forward. <clears throat> the next neighborhood we're going to visit is Sunset Park. Uh, this next interview is with Wang Chun Wai. Um, I do also want to point out the ephemera we found here. This is a 1997 educational booklet uh, that I'll show you more of on the next page that was actually produced by Brooklyn Historical Society. Chinese-American Planning Council at 6022 7th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. Okay, can you give me your Chinese name? My Chinese name? Uh, Wang Chun Wei. Okay. Um, can you tell me when you came to the, uh, the Sunset Park area? I came like around roughly nine years ago in, on May, let me see, May 19, 1984. Then is, was this the first place that you came to? Yes. When you came to this country? Yes. And where were you born? I, were, uh, I was born in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. And can you tell me what year? Uh, 1964. 1964? Yeah. Okay. And, did, and you just sort of lived in Hong Kong before coming here? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you came here, um, you were then? 19. 19. And you came with your family? Yes. And how many people were in your family? Totally six. Mm -hmm. my, uh, my parents and my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the oldest. And uh, but, uh, my grandparents, they uh, came here like, I'm not excited. I think it's seven. My grandma came here like seven years. Eight years earlier than we than us, and my but my grandfather, he came here many 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 years. I don't even know how many, how long. So, first of all, uh, is is we the real reason why we came we came is because of my parents, grandparents, yeah. So when did you always know that you would be immigrating no, to the U.S.? No, I know it like about like a year before we came. A year before you came? Yeah, because we have to file all the uh, forms. We have to do all the uh, um, uh, medical reports. So then I know what was going on. Yeah. Then, then my mom told us we are going, we are, we are applying for the immigration in uh, New York to, to uh, live with my grandparents. Yeah. And I don't know much about immigration because at that moment, uh, nobody even think about immigration in Hong Kong because 
at that moment, at that time, he was always feel like Hong Kong is the best place to live. They, they did nothing, nobody even talk about the, the uh, 1997. Nobody talk about that. So who cares? And people ask me, why you could, where you go there? And I say, oh, I don't know. I have to follow my parents. I'm, I'm, I'm young you now. So they go, I go. And also I feel like, oh, it's a new place. Might be interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I want, to, I want to see. And one of, another reason why is I feel like I get more chances for to 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 uh study to study uh in uh, college than in Hong Kong because in Hong Kong it's very 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 competitive. Yeah. So these are some shots of the interior of the uh, educational booklet I mentioned. Uh, it centers very much on the different ethnicities and groups that were settling in Sunset Park and provides a timeline um, of when people were coming into the neighborhood. Again, notably for this slide, uh, the Chinese population in Sunset Park jumped from 1,981 to 8,292 in 1990. Michelle, uh, yes. I think we're not seeing the slides right now. We're still seeing um, the oral history page. Oh, thank you so much for letting me know. Um, So let's see. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so again, you have quotations here from people who are living in Sunset Park around what kind of foods are sold in your neighborhood. Uh, Sunset Park is home to many people. Um, on the left hand here, you don't have to go to Chinatown anymore to buy groceries. My parents loved this area. When we first moved in, you had to buy these big bags of rice, the gigantic bags from Chinatown and carry them back to Brooklyn. Not anymore. Uh, you can get everything on 8th Avenue. Uh, the Puerto Rican population also grew from 1800 and 1950 to 24,000 by 1970. So you also see um, people talking about the kinds of Puerto Rican foods that are sold in the neighborhood. <clears throat> so our next slides here uh, are in Crown Heights and the West Indian population in Crown Heights. So let's click in for our next oral history and not lose the presentation in the process. Moving from Jamaica to Crown Heights, uh -huh. and you spent most of your life in Jamaica? Yes, I did. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how your family chose to move here, like why they chose to move here, or? Oh, my mom chose to live here because of um, economic reason. Mm -hmm. uh, jobs weren't that available that much for a person who is unskilled. So she came here for a better life. When she came here, she started doing nanny, nanny housekeeping. Mm -hmm. And then she started year, a couple of years after she went into the field of nurse's aid at a nursing home. She's still there right now, but um, she had an accident at work, which limited her um, work, work skills. So she's assigned to lesser work, easier work, not with strain on her arms. Uh, I followed her shortly. Shortly after that, I followed her here with the same idea because I too was unskilled and I needed to make something better of myself. Um, so the, you had a lot of high hopes kind of coming yeah. in and yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I basically wasn't, wasn't ready for this onslaught of different people, different backgrounds, different everything, culture, the food, the, the churches. Mm. I wasn't ready for this big thing. But little by little, I, I, I came into my own. I started mm. 
going to a church. I started, um, I did the home melted, home melted course. I, I worked for nine years as a home attendant. Mm -hmm. I worked for six months as a nurse's aide. And before that, I too was a nanny housekeeper. And that's basically it. Mm -hmm. So can you go back, do you remember the first day that you were here in in Crown Heights or I mean, in New York? Like what, what was that? I mean, cause that must've been one of the most shocking days that like first kind of day or week. My first kind of day, I was thinking, please let it snow today. I didn't know when the, about the four seasons, all I could think of, I want it to snow today. I remember back at home, I look on the, uh, the jam, the, the marmalade bottle, and I saw a strawberry, and there is no strawberry in Jamaica. I said, when I get to go abroad, that's the first thing I want to try out. It looks so good on the marmalade bottle. Moving right along to our next oral history. from Glenda Cadogan from Trinidad. And journalists, Caribbean American community, native Trinidadian for Brooklyn Historical Society on the West Indian Carnival Documentation Project. How long have you lived in Brooklyn? Um, approximately seven years. You came from, where, where were you born? From Trinidad. What year you came to, what year you came to, um, to Brooklyn? What year you came to Brooklyn? Yeah, I came to Brooklyn 1988. Um, tell me something, when you came to Brooklyn, what did you do? And what was, what, what were your first impressions? When I came to live or when I came to time. When you came to live? Um, I have, I have, I have visited here numerous, numerous times before on, um, on the vacation and, and in the capacity of work. Um, at the time, I wasn't I wasn't too impressed with it. It was like five days things and stuff. But I came I came into here already knowing the place, um, having a lot of feel of the community, but um, having a lot of aspirations and and judging from what I've seen on those short visits, thought that um, you know there's there's a lot of opportunities and and uh, uh, a lot of warmth and a lot of you know vibrations within the community. I felt that I would fit in, you know, just right. You know, like it, it couldn't be like a second home then. That was the first feeling for the first year. Yeah. Now, um, when you when you when you were growing up in Trinidad. Um, if you were to compare the differences between when you first came to Brooklyn here and relative to what you knew in Trinidad, how would you how would you put it together? The differences? Yes. Well, first of all, that that um, communal spirit which I which I thought was uh, was was present here when I when I came on vacation. When you when you came here to live, you realized that was absent. Um, that that in Trinidad that kind of one of these a fair attitude, two, a real family kind of spirit where you could go to anybody's house and be at home. I, and when you come on vacation, they extend that kind of warmth to you. When you come here to live, right, you realize that it was different. That was the first mark difference. So people who you would call and think that, hey, it's no problem, I just spend the night, I just do whatever. Um, you realize that it's different. And um, you realize that you don't just drop by somebody's house that you called before. And, and then and then you start to notice differences in the people's attitude. And that was the, the biggest shocker for me. It was it was the biggest um the biggest problem block in adjusting to the difference in people's attitude because I'm looking for the same sort of spirit that um that that, that I had in Trinidad and as I said, I was I mistakenly thought it was present in Brooklyn. I realized that that was different. Um people still still had that what you call 
bathroom that party spirit people still like to have fun and like to have party but even there it's different it's more it's more structured um there was not a, a lot of spontaneity and uh, what i missed most was that spontaneity of somebody passing you, you know passing in the road and you know hey let's go here come in and see your house walking in there was no spontaneity at all everything was structured you do this you make a call this that and, and it took us some adjusting get, getting used to that <laughs> So moving here to our Puerto Rican population um, in Bay Ridge, the Columbia waterfront in East Williamsburg, I wanted to take a minute with these uh, two flyers as well, which are from our Jesus Colon collection. Uh, the flyer on the left is for a Noche Tipica Puerto Ricana. My pronunciation is terrible, please forgive me. Um, uh, and it features traditional Hibaro dances, including the Aguinaldos, the Seis. Um, Hibaro means country farmer, you may know. And today some Puerto Ricans identify themselves as Hibaros as proud connection with their Puerto Rican history and culture in, gen in general, uh, regardless of class or background. Um, and then the, the Puerto Rican colony of Brooklyn here on the right hand side, uh, this flyer for the post. I just wanted to read a little bit of this translation here. Um, again, not the best translation, but I wanted to get the real substance here, which is that the Puerto Rican colony of Brooklyn should not miss these two festivals, these Independence Day festivals, in order to show our compatriots that those of us who are far from our beloved little island in this metropolis feel nostalgia and love for our homeland, even with many years of not being able to aspire to the saturated breezes from the Caribbean Sea, but never forgetting our sacred cradle while sending a patriotic message to your beloved rock on a day as significant as the glorious Independence Day of the greatest nation in the world, greatest in peace and greatest in the heart of all citizens. Um, which is again, the sort of like additional level of justification of their patriotism and existence that many immigrants are asked to do implicitly or explicitly uh, when they migrate here. Uh, so the next oral history we're going to spend some time with is with Encarnacion Padilla de Armas, who lived in Bay Ridge around the same time. So this is a bit earlier than what we've been seeing. This is 1929, 1932, and this interview is taking place in the 70s. <clears throat> Thank you. Johnny Vasquez, interviewer for the Long Island Historical Society's Puerto Rican Oral History Project. My, my boat, that time we didn't have airplanes, and I landed in the pier. I was on my way to Holy Trinity Academy. Where? Alabama. Holy Trinity Academy in Alabama, where I went to school. How old were you then? Huh? How old were you then? I was 16. 16, 17. You, you came to live in Brooklyn first? No, I came over here. I spent two weeks in Brooklyn. And then I went to Newark. From Newark, I went to Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, I went to Washington, D.C. And from Washington, I went to to Holy Trinity where I finished my high school. And when I finished my high school in 1929, 28, I came back to Brooklyn. And I stayed with the missionary servants around 60th Street in Brooklyn. 60th Street? There. And that is about Bay Ridge. Yeah, the Bay Ridge area. Bay Ridge. And there I got my first job. I went to work in the library in the in the old Hamilton Library, putting the books in the shelves and catalog. I was about 18 or 19 years uh, old. What, what was the community like then? What year was this? Was this about 1929? 
What, what was the community in Bay Ridge where you lived? In, in Bay Ridge, where I was living in that time, 90% of the community in where in the circle, in the area where I was living, they were um, Italians and Irish. And there were very few Puerto Rican families. Did you know any Puerto Rican families in that area? I know three families. Which were they? There were Calderon and Melendez and another family by the name of Rodriguez. It was, no, I was very young and I was not involved in the Puerto Rican movement yet, as we could call it. But how many years did you, did you live there in that community? I lived over there one year, then I moved to Manhattan. And I live in Manhattan because I studied in Columbia University. And it was, the commuting was terrible from, the BMT was open the yeah. year I was living there. And you have to change train to go to the, to Manhattan in the IIT. And I moved to 107, 107 in, in and I work and I study over there. Then in 1930, I returned to Cuba. I I wish that I had more background about this photo from the Jesus Colon collection. Um, I do just want to take a moment to appreciate everything that's going on. It's unfortunate that the banner in the background is just obscured enough that I can't make it out. If anyone has eagle eyes and can, let me know. Uh, but Jesus Colon, uh, the person uh, for whom the collection is named, was born in 1901 in Puerto Rico to a working class family. As a teenager, he moved to San Juan where he joined the city's new socialist party and took on a leadership role in his high school's journal and literary society. Uh, he moved to Brooklyn at 16 and he arrived aboard the SS Carolina to live with his older brother, jo Joaquin. He faced difficulty finding employment in New York and worked a number of odd jobs, including dock worker and dishwasher when he first arrived. He earned his high school degree by attending night classes at Boys High School and he took college courses at St. John's University. During this time, he became active in the New York Socialist Party and became a founding member of the party's Puerto Rican committee. Next up, we are going to Brighton Beach and Coney Island. Uh, we have an ongoing Brooklyn Jewish history project, which are newly added oral histories and a, a programming series that's in progress as well about uh, Jewish identity in Brooklyn. Most recently, uh, our first installment was about uh, food culture um, in Brooklyn. So I will at the end of this uh, give an overview of how you can connect with us around the web, but programming is one of the big ways that you can do it. Um, different ethnicities of Judaism all over Brooklyn, um, including Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, and Hasidic Jews. Um, and we will go to one of these oral histories now. Today is November 21st, 2019, and I'm interviewing Charlie Doy. Charlie is 29, having been born August 20, 1990. My name is Ariane Loeb, and I'll be the interviewer. I'm recording this conversation for the Jewish History Project for the Brooklyn Public Library. Charlie, thank you for talking with me today. So let's start with, uh, where is your family originally from? Um, so my great-grandparents were born in the Russian Empire. Um, from both sides? From, on my, so my, dad's side both of his parents who grew up in brooklyn their parents were both yeah are all from russia um so various parts of the pale of settlement um do you have any idea when they came to this country where did they 
where they, if they went directly to Brooklyn or if they stayed in Lower East Side, for example? Yeah, so my, on my, um, I don't know about my grandma, my grandpa, his dad, Lewis, when he came to America, they started on the Lower East Side. And he was in a, I think, a big family that there was no father. So his mom and like a bunch of kids came over. Um, and from like census records I've seen, it seems like he was like working at a very young age and they had an address in the Lower East Side. Um, and then I think when he was in his teens, they moved to Bed-Stuy. Um, what was his profession? I don't remember. Uh, I learned. You don't know? At, at when he was young? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. And later on? Later on, I don't, my, I actually don't know. My, I know more about my, uh, my dad's mom's parents. So tell us. So they, um, I think they, he was born in Russia and then I don't. You're where? The city? I don't. No? Okay. Um, they they forgot all about it when they came to America. They just wanted to become Americans as soon as possible. Um, but they, he, my grandma grew up um, like a block from here. And actually she grew up on Carroll Street and her name is Carol, which I always thought was kind of lovely. Um, and they were, I think originally Weinsteins, but they changed the last name to Winston. Um, because what I was told is that my great uncle Stuart, my grandma's brother, wanted to go to um, a prep school, like a really good high school, and then Williams College. But at the time, there were quotas for Jews, um, or at, at the very least, the thought of having a Jewish last name would work against you to get into these schools. So partly they say they changed the last name um, so that he wouldn't appear Jewish. And actually, my uncle Stuart, like, my grandma talks like this, like she's very Brooklyn and my, but her brother like has a British accent. Um, and I think it's because he went to this prep school and he went to Williams and he like kind of rid himself of like Brooklyn Jewishness to the point that like, he talks like this, like my uncle Stuart and his like sister is, you know, the most Brooklyn person you could imagine. So I, I really do think that they, they were really affected by this like sense of what they had to do to, you know, achieve, be American. be American, or maybe even be, I mean, in his case, be British or something. I don't even know, but. Yeah, that pressure to assimilate, right, that many immigrants feel. So the next couple slides are maps. I saw somebody in the chat had asked about Sunset Park, what uh, comprises the neighborhood of Sunset Park. You can see it here um in this corner so the exact um area like avenues and streets that it is bound by are uh i would say like fifth avenue between the 20s and 50s please somebody correct me or give exact specifications in the chat or um but that is the area of of brooklyn that sunset park habits uh right here you have Bay Ridge, and you can see that there is a legend uh, that indicates where there is a concentration of different ethnic groups and enclaves uh, around Brooklyn. So some of the areas that we have seen so far include Crown Heights, um, which include uh, Black U.S. born and Black West Indian populations. Uh, we have also, here's Midwood, somebody was asking about Midwood earlier. Uh, so we see a lot of European descended Jews in the purple. Uh, this map is again from 1985. Um, who lives where? And the sources are US census data for this and the next maps that we're going to be looking at as well. And all of these materials for the most part um, are available on all of our uh, digital portals, which I believe Alethea has been sharing out into the chat, but you can search our collections and spend a lot more intimate time with these materials yourselves. Um, these two here, uh, again, census derived data about the distribution of the Puerto Rican population, uh, which you can see this densest area here is East Williamsburg area, but then there's some thatch work over here. Um, and this is sort of the like Red Hook, Columbia waterfront, Williamsburg area as well. 
Sunset Park, and then the this Polish foreign stock map from the 1970s with a very 1970s color scheme. And then again, a few more stories of individuals to tell to sort of round out the day. Um, Martha Gale collection is also one of our collections here at the Center for Brooklyn History. She was born on the island of Jamaica in 1902 and she traveled to the United States in 1924 on board the SS Allegria from Jamaica and landed six days later. Uh, her final destination was Brooklyn Records listed her occupation as a domestic worker and that she was not married. But having established good footing in the United States, Martha Gale was able to accommodate and help her niece, Daisy Mae Parnell, who lived with her in Brooklyn for many decades. Uh, she was also very helpful to her family in Jamaica, uh, which was revealed by correspondence that records her uh, sending and helping out in any way she could, sending money and so forth. Um, she became a naturalized citizen in 1947, and for the next few decades lived in Bed-Stuy, uh, where she started out renting and eventually owned the apartment buildings at McDonough Street and on Macon Street. Um, and it was through the rental income of these properties that she was able to transition from domestic work into self-employment as a landlord. And the story of Hattie Carthan. Um, in some ways, she is representative of the Great Migration experience. Uh, she was born in 1900 in Virginia, and she moved to Brooklyn by 1928. Um, beginning in 1964, Hattie Carthan led what would become a decades-long campaign to protect, preserve, and plant trees in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, the most famous of which is the Magnolia Tree, which is at 697 Lafayette Avenue, bordering uh, Tompkins Park in that area. And that Magnolia Tree is one of the only, it is the only living historic landmark in New York City. Um, it was brought to, it's also native to the South, and it was brought to New York in the late 19th century by William Lemkin and planted. And then Hattie saved it from not only being uh, torn down, but also the apartment buildings around it from being raised uh, to make room for uh, more gentrified buildings. Um, but this campaign began in 1964 um, and she planted trees and founded a number of different environmental sort of like um, some of the first uh, efforts to combat uh, environmental racism uh, beginning very early uh, and founded environmental and community organizations that brought together issues of neighborhood beautification, urban ecology, uh, and community empowerment. She was awarded a Distinguished Service Award in 1975 um, and a medal from the city for her work and she became known as the Tree Lady of Brooklyn. She died in bed in 1984 at the age of 83. So that brings me to the end of my part of this presentation, but we do have plenty of time for questions um, and interaction. And if anybody wants to go back to another slide and spend more time with it, uh, now's the time. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, feel free to put any questions you all have in the chat, or you are welcome to take yourself off mute, pop your video on if you feel comfortable. Um, Michelle is here for the next 15 to 20 minutes for anyone that wants to chat more about all of the great information she just shared. Yes, I see in the chat, Kelsey's asking, type the name of the interviewee from Trinidad, yes. And is Glenda Cadogan, and I hope I'm saying that right, but um, let me also just get back to the presentation. And I can send you a link directly to
good. Kelsey found it. Um, there's also a question about segregation in Brooklyn um, and why. I don't know that it is the most segregated borough, but to find answers to questions about segregation, we need to look at sort of federal housing policy throughout the 20th century and the practice of redlining, which very much uh, supported and enforced uh, racial segregation along neighborhood lines by giving letter grades to neighborhoods um, and uh, refusing to extend loans to families uh, on the basis of race and ethnicity. There's a really incredible project called Mapping Inequality uh, that allows you to explore not only a map, but also these documents that supported racist housing policies um, and prevented um, families of color, black families and uh, other families from actually uh, being able to build the wealth uh, to uh, provide uh, upward mobility in the world. Um, so mapping inequality. It's a Richmond University project. I have a question, Michelle, <laughs> for you. Yeah, Alicia. Um, so I mentioned to you before, I live in Midwood in Brooklyn. And so I've always been curious, you know, as you get closer to this area, like Ocean Avenue and Ocean Parkway, you notice the changes in like the housing structures and how they get bigger. Um, and I was curious if you knew, you know, had they always been that way? Was there a reason for them, the houses being so big, especially in these particular areas and what the history is behind that? Yeah, that's a great question that, um, and as I maybe said earlier, but want to put a fine point on and underscore, please do reach out to us at CBH reference at bklynlibrary.org with uh, questions just like this one, because some of them do involve digging into our materials and resources um, to put together the answer. Um, but one of the reason, one of the, thank you, my colleague Diana just put it in the chat. Um, and I'll also say if Diana feels like chiming in to answer any questions, <laughs> not that this is hers or she has to, not to put you on the spot, but um, in terms of uh, the, the I, I think that the answer is basically at a top level would involve zoning law and availability of land and being able to compare maps at different points in history throughout the 19th uh, to mid 20th century to see the footprints of the homes and whether what was there at previous points because you do often find that there are larger houses, single family homes that then get raised to build uh, apartments to house more people at different points in the city. But in, in Midwood, uh, I know what you're talking about along Ocean Parkway. I remember I first moved to Brooklyn uh, 10 years ago. Um, and I remember riding my bike along Ocean Parkway and just being amazed at the size of the houses, which seemed very un-Brooklyn to me because I was so new to the borough. Um, but Alethea, I do want to spend more time with your question, so maybe we can chat more afterward. Looks like we got a question from Felicia about Greenwood Cemetery. Do you have any interesting facts on its development or importance? So Greenwood Cemetery. This is fun. This is like testing my my knowledge, my short order trivia knowledge, but Greenwood Cemetery um, is the tallest point in Brooklyn, uh, for one, that's a fun fact. It was a prominent site during the Battle of Brooklyn during the Revolutionary War because of its height. Um, and let's see, what can I tell you more about Greenwood Cemetery? It was founded in the 1830s, I believe. And other fun facts about Greenwood who's buried there, uh, Basquiat, Leonard Bernstein. Um, it's a national historic landmark. It's 478 acres. I only just started looking things up for you. Um, 
And the monk parakeet, this is a fun fact that I researched, 1838, Diana added to the chat. Um, the monk parakeets that inhabit the gates at the entry point that's along um, Fifth Avenue and like 21st Street, um, there's some speculation as to how they ended up in Brooklyn. And one of the sort of apocryphal stories is that a crate was dropped on the tarmac at Idlewild Airport, now JFK, um, and that the monk parakeets escaped and found this uh, little nest to inhabit. But they are the they're monk parakeets. That's the the type of bird that are living in the gates. Um, and speaking of Diana chiming in with great information, she also wanted to, yes, when the BQE was built, the question around Sunset Park and the exact boundaries of the neighborhood, when the BQE was built, it affected the neighborhood boundaries, she says. Um, the southern edge of Sunset Park is around 65th Street and it extends over to 7th Avenue, but neighborhood boundaries are indeed always porous. Um, and as we've seen, you know, different people have different interests in sort of expanding or contracting neighborhood boundaries. Um, I could also add another fun immigration related fact about Sunset Park real quick. Um, Thank you. Some of the um, early 20th century immigrants in Sunset Park were from Finland. Um, there were also a lot of Scandinavian um, immigrants in Bay Ridge, um, Norwegian and Swedish, but the um, Finnish immigrants in Sunset Park um, are generally credited with bringing the concept of a co-op to New York City. So a co-op building, um, which is so common in the city now, that was actually brought by immigrants. Yeah, thank you, Diana. And the Sunset Park was known as Little Scandinavia, right, for a period of time. Um, owing to the preponderance of Scandinavian immigrants in the area of co-op. Cool. Um, were immigrants welcome to this area? In the sense of economic... Saying, so the Sorry. Greenwood, the, the Greenwood Cemetery probably has some of the oldest trees too, I would think. That cemetery. Yeah. I know you yeah, it's also um, an arboretum. An arboretum. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing in the chat, small correction, it's green wood, not green wood. It's actually capital G green hyphen wood to be exactly correct about how this the uh, organization spells its name and arboretum. Um, were immigrants welcome to this area in the sense of economic help, such as housing and so on? Uh, Diana, can you help me answer this one? Do you have any specific um, knowledge of programs in Brooklyn or New York specifically? Yes, and Natiba Guy Clement is here, the director of the Center for Brooklyn History, assistant director, um, who's saying we have a great curriculum packet on Greenwood if anyone wants to um, check out some quick information. I can share my screen again real quick to um, and just give people a quick tour of our collections page. This is our home on the Brooklyn Public Library website. In order to search our collections, go to our collections and search. And these are all broken down by type. So you can look here for books, photographs, the archives and special collections, our oral histories, maps, film and video recordings, the newspaper headlines that you saw all came from our Brooklyn newsstand. These are all available remotely um, and keyword searchable, accessible from anywhere. Um, and they cover between 1809 and 1909 with our local paper, or 1809 and 1999, I'm sorry. Um, our art and artifact collection and then the telephone directories. And the curriculum packet that Natiba just referred to is here in our educator resources. And they're all broken down uh, again by subject area. There's so much rich material here to dig into. 
this primary source packet area, view and download them here. So these Greenwood Cemetery right here. Yes, and Diana is saying in the chat too, one way in which immigrants were welcomed in Brooklyn is that the Brooklyn Public Library carried books and languages appropriate to neighborhood residents. And that's something that is uh, an ongoing uh, facet of collection development at all of our branch libraries. Well, we have time for one or two more questions if anyone else has any. So glad it was interesting. It was, I feel like I learned a lot, which I told you before we started was, um, I was really excited because I don't know a lot about Brooklyn. Yeah. Do you want, is there, is there something that really stands out to you? Um, I'll have to think. We have another chat. Yes. Um, it was originally the Long Island Historical Society. We have so much information about Coney Island and the Wonder Wheel. Again, those educator primary source packets are um, a great place to start. It's like a jump starter for research, research. but then our digital collections portal, um, which you can find from our home on Brooklyn Public Library's website. If you, you can search by place or by keyword and you can look there for historic photographs about Coney Island, the Wonder Wheel postcards, our ephemera files. Again, please do write to us uh, with your reference questions. And the Wonder Wheels longtime owners were a Greek immigrant family. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, and to all of the Center for Brooklyn History colleagues that were on. Um, I love hearing all of you guys playing off of each other. That's amazing. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming. Um, we will send out this recording um, to everyone once we are finished captioning and making sure it's up to accessibility standards. But otherwise, have a great rest of your Thursday um, and a great rest of your semester. <laughs>